my guess is that everybody sitting here and listening to the sound of my voice knows someone who they consider to be one of those, what I would call a wise old sage. You, you, do we, everybody know one of those people? For me, it was my grandpa, or was, it was, it still is. <laughs> he, my grandpa is, is probably one of the wisest men I know. And I, I remember just even at a, at a young age of, of him sitting me down and we'd have conversations for, I mean, they literally last for hours. And we'd talk about things, and you know, he'd talk about how um, children are a product of of their raising, and how we seem to kind of follow the same cycle that our parents did, and, and you know, we end up raising our kids in the same manner. And and I just, you know, wise sage old advice for you know, at the time I was like ten or twelve, you know, I, and, and I, you know, I wish I had I had paid a lot more attention um, than to just the few stories that I did. Um, but what I did glean, I'm very, very thankful for. Today we're going to take a look at Proverbs 1. And I kind of got an about face this week. And I, I was talking with a friend of mine, and and he, he had a word of the Lord for me, and he's like, you need to preach through Proverbs. I've never preached through Proverbs. I, I, I have no idea what to do. And he's like, well, rely on God. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so we're going to go through Proverbs, and I'm going to try to take it a chapter at a time. Um, you know, we, we, you know, depending on special occasions, we might, you know, skip a week or two here and there. But um, we're going to we're going to attempt to do this. Now, I'm going to do this a little bit different than what I normally do. So yeah, here I'm out of my box. You know, I'm, I'm having to do something new. So what I'm going to do instead of reading all 33 verses of Proverbs one. We're going to go through verse by verse what um, 88.1 does. You know, the, 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 a lot of the preachers on there go verse by verse, and it, it really is kind of cool. So we're going to start Proverbs 1 here, and, and um, verse 1 says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel. You know, that, that's kind of a, a, a real um, identifying statement. Now, there are people who agree and or disagree over whether or not that encompasses encompasses the entire book, or whether this is just the first section of it, it's like the first nine nine chapters or so of Proverbs. Um, so whichever one you take it from, these are you know at least from from Solomon, um, son of David, king of Israel. Um, so verse two, he says, for gaining wisdom and being instructed, for understanding insightful sayings. Th- this is a summary. This is the why. This is the purpose of the book of Proverbs. The purpose is for the, 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 the idea of, of gaining wisdom, for, for being instructed, for understanding and insightful sayings. You know, wisdom, you know, we kind of think of wisdom as, as this physical and, and mental kind of thing, but it, it's, it, it's more of a moral and ethical kind of a, a, a code if you will, that, that we follow, okay? You know, wisdom, you know, we, we, we seek wisdom, you know, to gain wisdom, and, and it says for being instructed. Um, um, you know, the word for that, you know, kind of is discipline, you know, to be, to be disciplined in the faith, you know, in, in the faith, so that we're, we're morally disciplined and, and we're able to be corrected. So that, that's the purpose of Proverbs. It's the, for the explicit, explicit purpose of of being disciplined and and, and corrected with this moral and, and ethical um, way of thinking. And then he rounds out the second half of that verse with four understanding, insightful sayings. Uh, um, you know, it's you know, cat, don't cast your pearls before swine. You know, kind of an old an old saying, you know, that's from scripture, but you know, it's one of those old sayings that, that, you know, it's, it's, that's the whole purpose of it is to, to gain wisdom. What does that really mean? Not to cast your pearls before swine. So that, that's kind of where we're going with that. And, and, you know, this, this, this understanding insightful ways that, that, that word for understanding, it's kind of a, a a way of, of spiritual discernment. Okay. You know, it's one of those where where it helps to distinguish 
between things. And that's what, that's what discern, discernment's all about. You know, it's you know, being spiritually discerning. You know, when you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, you, you can be spiritually discerning. You can tell evil from good. You can you know, discern between right from wrong and, and you know, um, direction for your path and you know, from what God is trying to get you on. So you know, understanding these sayings, you know, God can speak to us through, through all of these things, and that's what wisdom is. That's what the Proverbs are for. It's for the wisdom. It's for the discipline. It's for the understanding of all of these things. This first section here, it's seven verses long, and and he breaks this this summary statement of verse 2 down into two different sections. And verses 3 to 5 is this, this next section. And it reads as such, it says, For receiving wise instruction in righteousness, justice, and integrity, for in teaching shrewdness to the inexperienced, knowledge and discretion to a young man, a wise man will listen and increase his learning, and a discerning man will obtain guidance. You know, that, that first word there, that, that integrity is the one, you know, it says receiving wise instruction and in righteousness, justice and integrity, you know, righteousness being, being, you know, set right before God and that, that, that we, you know, it's righteousness is without sin. It's just what it is. You know, if, if you're righteous, you are without sin. So the only one who's righteous is Jesus Christ. So that's why, you know, we have to trust in him as our savior because that righteousness imparts on us. Okay. You know, and that's the whole point of, of, of this wisdom. Okay. So justice and, and integrity, you know, integrity is, is this firm adherence to a, a code of, of moral ethics. And in, in our culture today, you know, people of integrity are, are, a lot more fewer and far between than they used to be. <laughs> um, you know, a, a handshake used to seal the deal. I mean, that, that was all it was needed because you were a person of integrity. When you give somebody your word, you don't go back on it, you know? So that's kind of where we're going here with this, this integrity kind of thing. Verse 4 says, for teaching shrewdness. Now, when I read that, I'm like, I kind of associate um, the word shrewd with, with being um, bad. You know, I'm a, somebody who's shrewd. I, I kind of think of that in kind of a negative connotation. But I've discovered that the, the shrewdness is actually defined as clever discerning awareness. That's how it's defined. Clever discerning awareness. Really? Okay, so teaching shrewdness would literally mean teaching that 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 keen awareness of of being able to cleverly discern things so it goes right back to this opening statement okay it goes back to that opening statement where you know it's for the purpose of gaining wisdom and being instructed and for understanding insightful sayings it says for teaching shrewdness to the inexperienced you know that that's when we go when we go up front and, and we confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, when we, when we make that commitment to God and to Jesus Christ, you see, we're, we're really inexperienced. And, and we, need, we need wisdom. We need that, 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 that wisdom that only God can give, that teaching and that instruction. We have to be taught how to discern between good and evil. We have to be taught how to discern between, you know, right and wrong and, and you know, how to evaluate each situation as it comes along. Verse 5 says that a wise man will listen and increase his learning and a discerning man will obtain guidance. And, and when I read that verse, I, I kind of think of, of, I go to Timothy and it says, you know, um, for men will gather among around themselves um, teachers who will tell their itching ears what they want to hear. And that's kind of where my mind goes to that. And I realized that there, there's a, di a difference. There's a distinct difference between tickling somebody's ears and telling them what they want to hear and seeking wise guidance. Okay, There's a huge difference. If we gather people around us who are, are always 
I don't want to say taking our side, but, but they're not telling us what, they, what we need to hear. They, they, they tell us what we want to hear, but they don't tell us necessarily what we need to hear. In other words, they're, they're, they don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to upset things. They don't want to risk that friendship. But a true friend will tell you what you're doing wrong and not hold any bones about it. <laughs> That is a true friend. Somebody who, who is not going to hold the punches back and, and give it to you just like it is. You see, we need that kind of wisdom. We need that kind of guidance. We need that kind of, of, of instruction and, and discerning ability between these things. We've got to be able to, to, to distinguish between seeking out people that tell us what we want to hear and seeking out people to tell us what we need to hear, not what we want to hear. He continues on in verse 6. He says, For understanding a parable, or a parable words of the wise and their riddles, a, a, a wise person understands the parables that Jesus Christ tells. They're not just in the New Testament. There are parables in the Old Testament as well. A wise person understands these. A wise person can look at the book of Proverbs and, and understand the difference between two sayings that sound pretty similar. You can tell the difference between that. Somebody who is wise can, can understand the words of the wise and, and the seeming riddles that, that sometimes wisdom presents before us. A wise man can discern between that. Verse 7, he says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. There you go. That is the crux of the matter. It's the essence of true knowledge. The essence of true wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. You see, most of the Proverbs that we're going to cover in this book compare the wise and the foolish. They compare the two of them, and it's no difference. He starts off here in verse 7 with that very thing. You see, the essence of true knowledge, the essence of true wisdom is the fear of the Lord. That's where it starts. It starts by fearing the Lord, awe, apprehension, and appreciation. That's a fear of the Lord. Okay? The fools, that word fool there, it is is somebody who's arrogant. It's somebody who's coarse. It's somebody who who ends up rejecting God. It's somebody who who ends up rejecting not only God but godly wisdom. Okay, it's somebody who just completely rejects the whole thing. We continue on to the second the second um, um, section here, and it, the second section is is it talks about you know this this violent path. Verse eight it says, "Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and don't reject your mother's teaching." You, you see, why should we listen and learn? Well, he goes on. He says, "For there will be a garland of grace around your head and a gold chain around your neck." In other words, it's going to save you from making stupid mistakes. Pay attention to your father's teaching and listen, or listen to your father's and teaching and, and um, pay attention to your mother's and don't reject your mother's teaching. You know, the, these, these teaching, and, and this is kind of an assumption, an assumption of being raised in the Lord, you know, because this is talking, this is initially talking to the Israelites here, you know, in, in the Israelite household, you, you, they are raised in the fear of the Lord. So he's telling these kids, these children, these, these people who are, are listening to this instruction, don't reject what you're being told because it, it's going to keep you from trouble when the time comes. Okay? It's not that it, if it comes, it is when it comes because trouble's going to come. It's just it's the way it is. It's the way it is. But it's going to be a garland around your head. It's going to be a collection. It's going to be, you know, garland. You know, I, I think of Christmas, and you go back to, you know, those itty bitty strings of tinsel, and it's all collected together. It's all gathered together into this, this strand. You see, that's wisdom, and that's teaching. You know, it's all of this stuff that's, that's collected together, and, and the whole point of wisdom is that you pay attention to it on the front end rather on the. <laughs> rather than on the opposite end, okay? 
verse 10 to 14, this is kind of a, this is peer pressure and temptation. Listen, he says, my son, if sinners entice you, don't be persuaded. If they say, come with us, let's set an ambush and kill someone. Let's attack some innocent person just for fun. Let's swallow them alive like Sheol, still healthy as they go down to the pit. We'll find all kinds of valuable property and fill our houses with plunder. Throw away, throw in your lot with us and we'll share our money. You see, peer, peer pressure, <laughs> peer pressure is a big problem, especially when we're young. When we, when we're in, in those young situations, you know, it's that peer pressure that, well, come on, we need to, you know, let's, we're going to a party tonight. We're going to a party tonight, and there's going to be some alcohol there. You know, we need to go, and we need to, we need to go have fun. Well, no, I, I, I really, no, I, I, I can't. Oh, come on, what are you, a wuss? Come on, it's, well, just go to the party. You don't have to drink a beer. No, no, I, I really, really, really shouldn't. Come on, what's wrong with you? You experience something like that? You know, it, it's, it's, it's almost like they're putting you down as they're trying to, to tempt you. you know, it's this t- it's talking about how, you know, let's, let's swallow them alive like Sheol, Sheol meaning death, and into the pit like in the pits of hell. It's, he, he's, you know, it, it's, it's tempting you, and that's, that's what Satan tries to do, and he, he tries to, to tear us away from God, and, and it's all of this temptation wrapped together, and that's what peer pressure and temptation, are. It, it's, it's trying to get you to succumb to an, pretty much to an anti-wise way of, of thinking. I don't know if that's a word, but if it's not, I just made it up. <laughs> but it, you know, it's, it's, it's just an, it's anti-wise. It's just not, it's not a good idea. <laughs> How about that? It's just not a good idea. And the author goes on and he says, my son, in verse 15, my son, don't travel that road with them or set foot on their path because their feet run towards trouble and they hurry to commit murder. It is foolish to spread a net where any bird can see it. But they set an ambush to kill themselves. They attack their own lives. Such are the paths of all who pursue gain dishonestly. It takes their lives of those who profit from it. It's an urging It is an urging, and it is the beginning of him laying out the consequences. He's in transition here. He's moving from the second section to this third section here in this next chapter. And he's transitioning into this, this, you know, laying out the consequences of of our actions. And if we don't heed wisdom, then we're going to pay the consequences for our lack of attention. In this next section, before I start breaking all this down, I need to tell you that this next section talks about wisdom. It personifies it. It puts wisdom into the place of as like it's a human being, but it's it's you know, it's not really. It's it's just a metaphor and a figure of speech. You know, it's just. But it's it's a personification of of wisdom. Verse 20 says, Wisdom calls out in the street. She raises her voice in the public squares. She cries out above the commotion. She speaks at the entrance of the city gates. How long, foolish ones, will you love ignorance? How long will you mockers enjoy mocking? And you fools hate knowledge. If you turn to my discipline, then I will pour out my spirit on you. You see, wisdom... This personification, wisdom appeals to everybody. You know, not in the sense that, you know, ooh, I like wisdom, but it appeals to, it's appealing as a plea. It's, it's pleading with people. You know, wisdom seeks people out not, not to love ignorance. He talks about how not to love the evil ways. These two effective questions right here in verse 22, it says, How long, foolish ones, will you love ignorance? How long will you mockers enjoy mocking? And you fools hate knowledge. These two two questions distinctly call out people to leave the foolish ways, to to embrace wisdom, because it, it personifies wisdom as calling out on the street. Wisdom's calling your name. Don't follow down the wrong path. I'm calling to you. Please follow. 
verse 23 is a picture of repentance. If you turn to my discipline, then I will pour out my spirit on you and I will teach you my words. If we repent, if we take on the wise words that we're giving, God will pour out his spirit on us and we will be wise. If we listen to the wisdom that she brings. Verse 24, since I called out, and you refused, extended my hand, and no one paid attention. Since you neglected all my counsel and did not accept my correction, in turn, will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you, when terror strikes you like a storm, and your calamity comes like a whirlwind when trouble and stress overcome you. The fool ignores. The fool ignores. And he does this because, you know, wisdom calls, but but if we... If we ignore that wisdom, wisdom isn't going to save us in our calamity. If we ignore the words of wisdom, it will bring calamity. It's a matter of fact. We can't listen to words of wisdom and let it pass in one ear and right back out the other because we will pay the consequences for it. Verse, don't breathe on the microphone. Verse, um, where is it? There it is. Um, Verse 26, he says, I in turn will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. You know, it it, kind of seems cruel, doesn't it? It it really kind of seems cruel. Wisdom's just going to sit there pretty much laugh in your face. (laughs) Look at you. You didn't pay attention to me. I told you so. But it's not really that kind of, it's a a picture of judgment is what it is. You, you, you. I told you so. I told you that you needed to to avoid this and do this instead. But yet you didn't listen to me. And when you call out to me, I'm not going to answer. Verse 28, they will, then they will call to me, but I won't answer. They will search for me, but I won't, but won't find me because they hated knowledge and didn't choose to fear the Lord. were not interested in my counsel and rejected you know, all my correction. They will eat the fruit of their way and be, gu- be glutted with their own schemes. For the waywardness of the inexperienced will kill them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live securely and be free from the fear of danger. It's the consequences of not heeding wisdom. Wisdom calls out to us, but if we ignore, we will pay the consequence at our own risk. The fool ignores wisdom, and he does so at his own risk. The consequences for not fearing the Lord, my friends, are very steep. Because as I I try to round all this first chapter, chapter together, one thing occurred to me. And that is the fear of the Lord. Verse 7a, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. You know what? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. It comes down to a belief in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That, my friends, is where it all starts. It all starts as taking Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. It doesn't end there, but that's where it starts. Okay? Even as believers were called to heed the wise words of the book of Proverbs and and, and, in the entire book, you know, the book of the Bible, we're called to heed these wise words because it starts and it ends with Christ as Lord and Savior, not just accepting his salvation that he gives us, but making him literally the Lord of our lives and paying attention to everything that he's calling us to. And the trouble is, if we're not heeding wisdom's rebuke, then we risk becoming prideful and we risk falling. Mark 2.17 uh, uh, kind of occurred to me as I was studying this and it said, when Jesus heard this, he told them those who are well don't need a doctor, but the sick do need one. And I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. Wisdom is not for the wise. The wisdom is for the fools. And my friends, each and everybody sitting in this room, each and every person on this planet is literally a fool. We all are. Because we're sinners. 
we need a Savior. We cannot be wise to our own salvation. It just won't happen. That is why the Spirit comes over us and gives us that, that prevenient grace and, and brings us to Christ in the first place. We talked about this in the Sunday school, about how you know the only unforgivable sin is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Well, what is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Ignoring Christ... or the Ignoring the Holy Spirit's call to Christ as Savior. It's the only thing that can't be forgiven because you haven't accepted the one thing that can overcome it. You ignore the leading of the Holy Spirit, you're going to end up paying the consequences for it. Heed the words of wisdom that are calling your name. Go back to the beginning, you know, when I opened the, the, the sermon with, you know, everybody knows that, you know, that one of those wise old sages, you know, that, that one person in your life that you just, you hold above the rest because they're just so wise. More times than not, I have found that the, that wise old sage person in your life is probably saved. <laughs> they're probably saved because they've heeded the, that, that first step of wisdom because they've come to the, to the Lord in, in a fear of the Lord and, and they're, they're, they're honoring that as the beginning of knowledge. And when you acknowledge Christ as Lord and Savior, it starts. And that's where wisdom blooms from there by the power of the Spirit. I remember, remember back and he said that when you repent, I will pour out my Spirit on you and you will become wise. Yes, exactly. It's what the Holy Spirit does. He makes us wise to not only salvation, but to the ways in which God calls us to walk. So we have a choice. We can be wise to everlasting life via Jesus Christ, or we can rely on our own wisdom, and we can end up dying twice. So the big idea today is that that the purpose of Proverbs is simply to reveal Christ but it's also to reveal our need for salvation and His wisdom. We've got to have that wisdom that only Jesus Christ can provide. I got this devotion. Um, it, it's by a guy by the name of David Wilkerson. Anybody know that name? You know that name? Yeah, David Wilkerson, a big-time big, big time preacher out in New York. Um, t- the Times Square Church, if nobody's ever heard of him, um, died ooh, three years ago in a car accident. Um, just, just over, the anniversary just happened. Um, Oh my gosh, you talk about a wise old sage, David Wilkerson, man. He is, I get his devotions every, uh, every day and unparalleled, unparalleled to anybody else that I've read. And when I read this, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is an invitation. Indulge me for a moment, I'm going to read this. If you are a member of the body of Christ, get ready to face a mad devil. You may not want to think about it or even accept it, but if you have determined to follow Jesus with all your heart, Satan has marked you for destruction. And he's going to flood your life with troubles of all kinds. The Apostle Peter warns the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. 1 Peter 4, 7. He is saying, in other words, this is no time for lightness. You have to get a sober mind, you have to get sober minded about spiritual matters. It is an issue of life and death. Why the need to be so serious? The end of time is near and our enemy has turned up the heat. He's stalking us like a lion, hiding in the grass, waiting for an opportunity to pounce. He wants to devour us, to utterly destroy our faith in Christ. Some Christians say we shouldn't even talk about the devil, that we're better off just ignoring him. Others try to reason him out of existence. Liberal theologians, for example, argue that there is no devil, no hell, and no heaven. But the enemy of our souls is not simply going to go away. Few biblical figures have been identified so clearly and extensively. He is described as Lucifer, Satan, devil, deceiver, hinderer, wicked one, usurper, imposter, accuser, devourer, god of this world, ruler of darkness, old serpent. These emphatic descriptions tell me the devil is real, and we know from Scripture that he wields a very real power. Even now he is at work on earth in our nations, our cities, our churches, our homes, and in our individual lives. And we dare not be ignorant of his methods and strategy of warfare against us. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, steadfast in the faith, 
knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren are, that are in the world. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. Wiser words have never been spoken. That's why I shared that. Because it fits so well and with the, this, this, the beginning of, of, of fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom and knowledge. If we, if we believe that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom and knowledge, then we have to believe the, the opposite. We have to believe that the devil is out there working against us at every single point. Ephesians 6, we've got to put on the full armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. This, this stuff isn't just for, you know, it, it's not just in there for, for um, you know, words and, and directions. This, this is literal stuff. We have to put this, this helmet on our head, this helmet of salvation to guide and guard our mind. You know, this, this is all protective gear. You know, the, the, the sword, you know, the sword of truth. You know, it's, the sword is not just an offensive weapon, but it's also a defensive weapon against the devil. Because Ephesians 6 talks about how we can deflect all the flaming arrows. Pray a hedge of protection around your family. Pray edge of protection around your your um, the church. Uh, uh, a, a, I mean, anything. It doesn't make a difference what you pray a hedge around. Pray it. Protect your interests because David Wilkerson's right. If you're a devout follower of Jesus Christ and you're adamant about doing that, the devil is going to be one mad turkey. <laughs> he just is. He's going to be torqued off. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, do it now. Do it now. But I guarantee you, when you accept him as Lord and Savior, it is not going to be an easy path. It is probably going to be the most difficult path you've ever walked in your entire life. Ask any person in this church, and they will probably confirm that. Guarantee it. We've all had our struggles. The point is, is that we've got a family to rely on. We've got the Holy Spirit, and we've got a God who can move mountains. I've seen it. I've seen it. I saw it in the, in the life of a seven-year-old girl this week, which darn near brought me to tears. It's moving. Yes, ma'am. Go for it. It's all yours. Those that have a word, please share. Yep, it, it should be on. If it's not, John will get it on. <laughs> Am I on? I don't know what I'm going to say. I just know the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Otis talked about being pumped. I'm pumped. I'm excited. I'm full, and it's got to come out. Probably in tears and or words in my mouth, because what's in my heart comes out of my mouth. I'm excited because we all have a commission, and that's to share the love and the forgiveness of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what I'm getting ready to do. Would you be willing to go into prison to do that for these ladies at Rockville? Probably not. But I know that you are, you have, and you continue to support me in doing so. And I can't wait to do it. There's lots of chicken and noodles back here, and I hope that you join us. If you don't, please come back and get some and take with you. And I thank you for um, helping me share the love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Ms. Donna. The Spirit of the Lord's been on this place in the past, especially the past month or two. It's been here. I've seen people moved, you know, people moved to prayer, whatever the case may be, I've seen it. The Spirit of the Lord is here. Have no doubt about it. Stand and sing with me. <sighs> 